Hello, everyone. Welcome to the participants, judges, and audience members. Welcome to SOCAP uh, 2021. Uh, this is the Tuesday 115 uh, pitch session, um, Latinx Launchpad Latinas Who Lead Pitch Competition. My name is Jorge Calderon. Uh, I am the uh, Managing Director for Impact Investments at, at Hispanics in Philanthropy. Um, if we can bring up the slide, thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating today's pitch event. Uh, and for those who are less familiar with our organization, um, just briefly, we are over 39 years um, uh, in the making, uh, and we have been building uh, social justice and shared prosperity for the Latinx community across the Americas uh, for that time, and we will continue to be doing so. Um, I help lead our initiative uh, on decreasing the wealth um, management or the wealth gap uh, for, uh, by increasing our participation in the startup economy. We have three different programs uh, under this initiative, the Power Up Fund, which directly invests and supports early uh, Latinx startups. We have uh, also a, a brand new program called the Latinx Impact Venture Fellows, um, and this is developing the next generation of diverse investors. Uh, and then of course, uh, as today we're doing the Latinx Launchpad, another of our programs, this is a pitch competition series showcasing Latinx founders. We have um, the pleasure of having a, a fantastic crew of judges today. Um, joining us will be Cheryl Campos, the head of venture growth and partnerships at Republic, uh, where they're de democratizing uh, the investment process. Um, and she's also the co-founder of VC, VC Familia, uh, which is really trying to, again, um, engage and enroll the next generation of investors um, that are from Latinx backgrounds. And then we also have Krista Velasquez, um, who has been a pioneer in the impact investing space. Um, she's now the director of Lumina Impact and Impact Ventures, where they're doing um, investing in uh, uh, education-based uh, startups. Um, and then she's also a lecturer at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. And then, of course, we also have Jenny Flores, um, who is probably a stranger to no one. Um, she has been in philanthropy for quite a long time uh, on the finance side. Uh, she's currently the head of small business growth philanthropy at Wells Fargo. Uh, we have seven pitch finalists today. Uh, we're really excited about um, Greether, uh, that, who's uh, going to be presented by uh, Vanessa Carell. Uh, Palm, whose uh, uh, founder is Mary Ann uh, Kilgallion. Uh, Menstrual Mates, who will be um, presented by Cindy Bellada. Uh, Bilingue, uh, who is founded by Emily Ramirez, Lingo Health um, by Yaritza Vargas, um, and then Deal Engine by Vanessa Archibald Morales, and then Cali Bueno, uh, whose founder is Claudia L. Mercado. We're very excited to have these seven fantastic, talented women presenting today. Um, in terms of our overall process, uh, the pr presenters will have four minutes to pitch, um, and then we'll have a hard stop. Um, and then we'll have four minutes of Q&A and questions by the judges. Um, we'll also have a pretty hard stop on that as well. Um, during the presentation, uh, we hope that the audience, uh, you will be able to provide comments and feedback. Um, this is a great learning opportunity for the startups. So please add those in the chat box um, over the time so that the, the founders can read those afterwards. Um, after all the teams conclude, um, we'll have the moderator, uh, myself, um, and the judges will go um, and deliberate, and we'll come back uh, with the award winners. Um, during that time, the audience will be have the opportunity to uh, vote for the Audience Choice Award. Um, and we will also have a special fireside chat during that deliberation time uh, with Jennifer Garcia from LBAN um, and the Stanford Latino Entrepreneur Initiative. Um, after, that, after the deliberation, we'll come back and we will announce the award winners. Um, in terms of the judging for today, um, we've asked the judges to think about four uh, very specific elements. Really, um, does the presentation and, and the um, founder provide a real strong understanding of the problem? Um, and then are, is this the quality of the solution something that's unique and defensible um, and scalable? Um, and then what the judges might perceive in terms of how compelling is the team? What's the skill set they might have, the experience and expertise they might bring to the table? Um, and then one thing that we really want to emphasize is their ability to sell, right? So engage um, and convince uh, folks, bring folks on as advisors, uh, sell to the customers, uh, bring on teammates, et cetera. 
Uh, we have four fantastic awards. Uh, first place will be 15,000. Second place will be uh, 10. And third place will be five. And of course, the audience choice award will also be 5,000 as well. Um, so let me see if the judges have now been able to uh, get onto the back. And I think we have, let's see, Krista. Hi, Krista. Good to see you. Hi, Cheryl. Thank you for joining. Jenny, hi. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm glad everybody was able to get on okay. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so so now that we have our judges ready, um, why don't we, do we have our first uh, pitch presenter from Greether? Is she online? Yes, okay, no. fantastic. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so now, Vanessa, just so you remember, we have four minutes and we'll have a kind of a, a very, um, uh, very specific on the time. And so I'll let you know when those four minutes are up. Um, but please go ahead and start us out. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So now you'll be able to bring up your screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited today to present to you Greet Her. Greet Her is a travel safety app that connects female travelers to local women around the world. What is the problem? Well, from my Saturday, I conducted to over 500 travel travelers. 90% of female travelers reported the same concern. Getting around safely seems to be the number one stress factor for female travelers around the world. So after conducting that survey, I turned around and I started asking women that aren't traveling on their own yet. Yeah, and it turns out that 90% of them are also, 40% of them are also reporting the same concerns. How to navigate a place safely, communication and transportation are what are stopping these women from traveling on their own. So what is the solution for this? Great Hair is the app that connects female travelers to local women wherever they go. How does this work? Well, when a traveler is getting ready to go to a new destination, they can search for a local woman. Uh, they can filter by language, time, and dates. When a traveler is looking for their ne ne next destination, they can find the person that, choose, um, that matches their interests best. And then they can book them to, get, um, to greet them at the airport, Tailor an or just tailor an experience for them and um, use them as their local best friend wherever they go. Who are our greeters? Well, our greeters are verified, they speak your language, and they are experts on their home town. So you can choose from an array of personalities as well. And you will have someone that can guide you through the obstacles that come through travel. How are we different? Well, our service combines features from travel booking experiences, personal safety apps, transportation, and social platforms. But there is a twist. We do vet every user that comes through a platform, and they go through an interview process that where we verify our identity and fit because travel is, isn't just about safety. It's also about enjoyment. Our market opportunities are huge. There's $125 billion expected to be spent by women on travel solo this year. And 70% of women from our surveys reported that they feel safer when they, another woman is navigating them and guiding them. So each year, an increasing number of women are embarking on solo adventures. This keyword is so common that this increased by 1,000% from 2014 to 2020. And despite the global warning of do not travel from the pandemic, the trends are indicating that this is coming on stronger. With this trend, it's also coming um, another related topic, which is safety. So this is how we entered this market. Our revenue opportunities come from a double-sided market place where travelers will be able to book readers and the transaction fee will be coming from the travelers. Uh, there will be also a commission from our local guides where Great Hair will take 3% of the payment as commission for using our platform and helping with the verification process. We are now gathering a troop of supporters and partnerships 
that will help us get to where we need to be. And our progress to date is really exciting. With only under seven months of working full-time work on Great Hair, our progress has been impressive. We now have a working MVP, a dedicated team, press interest, market fit, verification process, partnerships, a daily organic growth, and we have hosted two events in person. And most exciting, we have now creators in 75 countries and 247 cities. Why support Great Hair? Well, our mission is supporting two of the most fundamental um, UN development goals. One, to reduce risks for women, and two, to increase income opportunities for them. Funds that will, that will gather throughout this process will go through verification process, which is... Um, okay. Our Thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> yeah. Very well I don't know, we're 30, 30 seconds, I think. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Okay, so we have our judges. Um, why don't we go in a bit of an order? Um, if, if you don't mind, Krista, could you kick us off, then Jenny, then Cheryl? Sure. Happy to, Jorge. Hi, Vanessa. So nice to meet you. As a nice solo you. traveler, I love this idea. <laughs> it's great. Um, I like that you focus on the UN goals, right, that you're trying to, to meet some of those. But um, could you help me understand the business model? So the travelers pay, um, you take a commission, do the um, the, the in-country uh, yes. greeters also get paid then? Yes, so greeters get paid through travelers. Um, and we are trying to encourage women to support each other as they navigate destinations. I think it, right now, more than ever, women and people uh, coming out of the pandemic are trying to travel more consciously and sustainable. And we want to support the local communities that have been hit the hardest, which we all know that women specifically and in the tourism sector have been hit the hardest. So um, that's why we are looking for women um, to be local guides in areas that they needed the most and encouraging travelers to think about how they're supporting them as they're traveling like you are. Great, just a quick question. What is the, the, the range of payments? Yes, so uh, it will vary according to location because, um, I mean, we can't charge the same right. base rate in San Francisco than in Mexico City. Um, so it will, it will depend on ge uh, geographical locations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Vanessa, great job. I'm curious, you said you have an MVP, 75 countries. What feedback have you received in terms of like what's working really well and potentially areas where you can improve? Yeah, we definitely need a lot of work with our um, technology because as it's a travel platform, um, women are on the go, right? And so we want to have this uh, mobile friendly application. So uh, that's why we're looking, seeking funding because we definitely need improvement on our technology. And there's a lot of features that we have plans to implement on the on the our new or future versions that will help women whether they're traveling or not. Great, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the team at the end of the day, right? Like, what are the the background, the sort of uh, technical expertise that you guys are bringing to the table? Because you know, this I think in order to execute on the vision that you guys have, um, the team is really what what comes down to it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I ran out of time uh, exactly as I showed that <laughs> showed that slide. But yes, um, we now have uh, nine members on our team. Really exciting. Um, with a really short amount of time, we have managed to gather a group of people that really believe in the mission. One of them is our rock star and software developer, Zahid, which has worked on, he has built himself several um, startups, one of them CryptoSync, which is an AI intelligence um, software. And he has over 13 years of experience with self, uh, software development. Um, and then we have our graphic and visual branding designer. We, um, she comes from a background of, um, in tech, both tech and a really feminine brand, uh, Zynga, as a her tech background. So she understands how technology startups can pivot sometimes. Um, and then, uh, Mercy Mama, which is a really well-known uh, jewelry brand, 
Um, so she brings in the feminine and elegant touch to our, uh, our, our visual branding. And then we have... Vanessa, um, yes. we are going to have to stop. That was four <laughs> minutes on the Q&A. Thank you, right. Cheryl, Jenny, Thank and Krista for those great uh, comments and questions. So we're going to move on to our next participant. Very well done, Vanessa. Um, right now, we're going to have Mary Ann from Pink Lotus Technologies and Palm be our next pitch presenter. Hi, Mary Ann. Hello, how are you? Good, good to see you. Are you all set with your slides? I believe so. Okay, fantastic. Make sure, um... All right, can you see my slides? Can you put them in presentation mode, Marianne? Yes. All right, how are we there? We're there, go ahead. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Kilgallen, and I'm the founder and CEO of Pink Lotus Technologies. And I'm happy to bring to you Palm, where we provide a child's profile and health data directly to 911 personnel in an emergency. I'm sure many of you are parents or grandparents, but did you know that every day thousands of children face injury and harm when they're in the hands of a caregiver? When I saw these numbers, I said this was unacceptable. So I became a mom on a mission. I wanted to help better protect our children and reduce these numbers. So I invented POM, which is an acronym for Peace of Mind Monitor. Our team has created a whole new segment called Child Safety as a Service, or CSAS. And it simply works with a wearable wristband that is connected to the POM mobile app. The parents and the children can communicate back and forth anytime and anywhere. If the parents realize that there's an emergency occurring, all they have to do is simply press the red 911 button on their POM app. And the child's profile and location will be sent directly to the nearest 911 call center where they can dispatch accordingly. Also, other family members will be notified via text message on their smartphones. POM is transforming child safety. We want to be the voice for your child when they can't speak up for themselves. There are other devices on the market, but they really just target for tracking. As you can see that our POM features and the benefits, we focus on data and emergency response. What makes us so exciting and why we're better and why we're different is that we are the first child platform to offer emergency intelligence data, such as name, age, gender, height, location, any health conditions, their blood types, um, any medications they may be on. This really helps protect lives when there's an emergency occurring. Our POM platform covers 94% of the country, and that's over 5,000 911 communication centers or 911 call centers. Even prior to our launch, our, we have received a lot of support from our local community, and we are very proud of our nationwide partnerships that we have established. The market size is pretty incredible. There's over 21 million children with a caregiver on a regular basis in this country. Why us and why now? Because we now live in a digital tech age where children as young as two years old are very comfortable with a smart device. How will we make money? We have a one-time purchase and a monthly reoccurring fee. Our go-to-market, we will continue our end-to-end -end testing along with the soft launch this quarter. Next quarter, we wanna increase our customer sales and scale our operations. I couldn't have done it without the incredible team that I have. We have over 120 years combined experience of marketing, uh, technology, finance, and business development. And we have a great team of advisors who are really guiding us on our journey. Even though we're just getting started, we are looking for the future. We want to give our customers enhanced safety features. And we also see another segment of future markets for human trafficking and aging with this technology that we have created. We're doing a seed raise of $2 million. We are looking for a lead investor. Or if you can connect us with any partnerships, that would be amazing. I want to thank you for your time, for listening to POM, and I hope that you'll join our mission to help protect children everywhere. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you so much, Marianne. Way to get it right in on the, on the four minutes. Um, well, how about we go for judges? Can we go Jenny first, Cheryl, and then Krista? 
Hey, Marianne. Hello. Hi. So as a mom, of course, this piqued my interest, <laughs> just understanding the platform. So I'm curious, you have over 2,000 customers, and there's nothing better to sell this than like what they are saying about whether they feel more secure. Like what are the, the KPIs that you're using to measure like customer experience or customer satisfaction? Yes, we actually had to do a lot of validation. We um, ended up doing the um, um, going around and talking to customers. We did the National Science Foundation, and we had to actually tell customers, ask them, what is your pain point? What are you looking for? And their main thing was them be, their children being abused and them not knowing it. Maybe they're too young to even, you know, comprehend what is happening to them. Um, so making sure that they're well and the safety was the number one pain point that parents pointed out to us. And they feel like this is for their children, like easy enough for them to understand. Like I push the button and like it's happening. Like they're using Correct. it. Correct. So as a mom, you're always connected with your child. You can be at work, you can be out of town and you still can see if they made it to school, if they're at the park, whatever's happening. And we do have different um, health metrics in there, um, biometrics, such as the health, the heart rate. So you can see if something's happening, if it's slowed down because maybe they're having a problem, a medical condition, um, or if it's going way too fast, maybe they're scared. So at that point, touch a button, you can call them in a second and they can touch one button and and give you an SOS and immediately through the, the app, you'll call your child. It's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, in terms of, it's, it's a hardware play, right? Which I feel like a lot of times, uh, especially with children and hardware, <laughs> right? I think uh, there's, there's a lot um, that can go right and wrong, right? And so one thing is we don't want the boy who cried wolf. We want like, you know, the, the, we don't want them to play with it. We don't want them to kind of, do you know other things that will set up alarms so my question is more around is there like a fail safe is there ways to kind of mitigate those things so that um you know you're not on alert all the time yes absolutely so um the children cannot do the 911 by themselves it has to go through the parents through the app the children can press um, a button on the side for three seconds and that goes as a sos message to um, all the guardians so the children will not be doing any false calls the parent instantly will see if it's an sos from the child if they're old enough if they're five six seven years old um, but there won't it's all navigated through the the app hi marianne this was great um, can you just help me understand the pricing? So there's the initial purchase and then a monthly fee. Is it per child or per family? Yes. Um, so it, they purchase the, the device, a one-time fee, and it is $9.95. It's a SaaS business model, so it is per child. I love the child safety as a service terminology. I think that's great. Yeah, we like to say that we're tech with the calls. I mean, people are afraid of technology, but we, our mission was to make sure that we made it very simple because a lot of grandparents are going to be actually navigating through this. So tech with the calls for everyone to simply understand. Great. The uh, judges, we have about 40 other seconds if you want to ask any more questions or provide any more comments. I'm just wondering what your margins are on this. Um, starting out, because we ordered such a small amount, we're at about 60% right now. We have an MVP coming out with 500 units for our soft launch. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mary Ann. Congratulations. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Um, now we're going to move on, and we're going to uh, hear from Cindy Bellarado. Um, from Menstrual Mates. Cindy, hi. hi. Good to see you. Good to see you. All, All right. right. Do you have your tech ready? Yes, I'm going to try sharing here. Let me know. No slides yet. If you can click share screen at the bottom. Okay, let's see here. Are you using PowerPoint, Google Slides, Keynote? Um, this is, can you see this screen here? We cannot. Okay, it said it shared. Let me try another way. 
Are you in Google Chrome? Yes. Okay. That should be. Let's see here. Let's do the Chrome tab. How about now? Yep. Okay. We're all good. Wonderful. Is that full screen? Yep. We're all okay. Good. All right. I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Cindy Belardo. I prefer she, her, a pronouns, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Menstrual Mates. Menstrual Mates is period care made simple through our eco-friendly products, our honest education, and our global social give back. So my background is in environmental studies pre-medicine from the University of Oklahoma, where over the past three years, I've become an expert in periods and have traveled to Northern India to survey first time menstrual cup users. So I've really learned the pain points that people are having across the globe. Together with my business partner, Drew Jarvis, she has a background in international business and marketing and has just completed a summer brand internship with Procter & Gamble. Our team of advisors and ourselves are entering the 1.5 billion global menstrual cup segment, which is growing two times faster than both tampons and pads combined. And what we found as the issues and current period care options is really twofold. So on one hand, most people, 63%, prefer to use tampons or pads. It's what they knew. It's what their moms taught them growing up. This is despite the fact that they're unsustainable. They're costly up to hundreds of dollars more than a menstrual cup would cost. And they often contain harmful chemicals or dyes. On the other hand, people are interested now in the menstrual cups. They've been around since the 1930s. And they are a nice eco-friendly alternative one menstrual cup can replace 528 tampons or pads per year, but they just really haven't gotten the adoption they deserve because they are very hands-on, there's a big learning curve, and the insertion process can be very intimidating. Um, so people are wanting a better option, but they just haven't found the best one yet. Through our surveys, we found that people want something that's user-friendly, effective, and comfortable. We find ourselves where sustainability meets user friendliness. And that's exactly what we are developing in our menstrual cup. Meet the Una cup and applicator. I have a prototype here. We currently have a provisional patent and we've addressed those key pain points of user friendliness without the harmful chemicals or dyes. It's effective. It holds three to five times more than a, than a tampon, excuse me. It can be worn up to 12 hours. There's a lot of great benefits. And like I mentioned, it can be used for over a year. This is sold at just $34.99, direct to our consumer through Shopify on our website and Amazon. We are using a buy one, give one model to stay true to our vision, which is to help end period poverty. So with every purchase, one will go donated to a menstruator in need. And we currently have a partnership right now with Period the Menstrual Movement, which is a global nonprofit. And we already donate 10% of our merchandise and graphic novel proceeds to this cause where they donate product to people in need. We have completed our first beta test and gotten positive results. We've reached over 20,000 potential customers through our online channels and in ad engagement surveys and tests. We have raised 135K to date, and we're now going into our second beta test with our finalized design. We're launching our Kickstarter for pre-sales in November, and we're currently raising a pre-seed round to help us launch the cup by Q2 of next year. Thank you so much for your attention. I would really appreciate any feedback, and if anyone would like to get connected, please do reach out. Thank you. Good job, Cindy. Fantastic. Um, why don't we start out with Cheryl and then go to Krista and Jenny? Thanks, Cindy. Um, I don't know how much I can share here, but um, there was a time in my life where it was hard to even buy pads, period. Right. And my mom had to sit down and literally tell me, like, you, we can't buy more than what you need. Right. Like, 
Um, so this is this is near and dear to my heart and part of the reason why I invest in Femtech and, and uh, Silverstack. So um, my question to you uh, is actually more of the mechanics, right? You mentioned it's kind of inserts like a tampon, but it's also, so uh, can you just walk us a little bit more about how to use it and also what the extraction process, right? And, you know, how is this, like you're going to educate people. So how are you, are you going to do it more visually? Or are you going to do it more through webinars, all of that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing, first of all. And I can demonstrate with our prototype here now. I think that's probably the best way. But we do plan to be on our channels to show video and just educate that way. TikTok, things like that are fun. So we have a fold technique here and then the outside of the applicator and you just twist it in like so. And then with the other piece here, we will push up and of course in your body, it will look a little bit different and it will open exactly how it should and then it will be released. So the rim is made so that it's firm enough. It will open correctly each time, at least that's the goal, and that you don't have to adjust and it's less hands-on. Yes, thanks for your question. Great. Hi, Cindy. This is really terrific. I'm, I'm curious, um, you have the product and then you also have education services. But if you're selling direct to consumer, I'm assuming that your target market is, is young, young women. Yeah. Um, do you prioritize them above, say, girls or older women who are still menstruating? Yes, that's correct. Our primary target from our engagement test so far, we are definitely honing in on, on the eco-friendly and socially conscious students, so specifically university students who are more open and have some, some more buying power of their own, and they're wanting to look for a more eco-friendly alternative. Yeah. Jenny. Yeah, I'm wondering, so first of all, thank you. I just love learning about new products and innovation in spaces that tend not to have a lot of innovation. So thank yeah. you for that. Um, I'm curious, like in terms of partnership, because I, Krista, I had the same question up front, like how you segment this and like where you're going to prioritize. Mm -hmm. um, like universities and like their like healthcare systems that are on campus, like I'm just curious, like how you're thinking about getting into market in a very organic way. Have you, can you share some of your initial things? Sure, sure, yeah. So universities and things, we found a lot of traction just targeting for people in that location, but we're not specifically going to universities at this point. We're really focusing on, on influencers and online. So we know that Gen Z is really on these social platforms and that influencers have a really big part to play in just giving some more trust to a product. So that's where we're working on our brand strategies and marketing strategies right now. Yeah. Great. I would also say mom of girls would be great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I think actually here that your Kickstarter will be very important because that's usually how a lot of femtech companies launch mm -hmm. and it also assesses product market fit. Right. So um, I hope that, you know, well, one, I think that's incredible. So if you need any help on that side, just let me know. But two, um, I think at, at some point uh, you you will have to get this pen to right? And then you can build a whole brand around that. Uh, what's the timetable on that sense? And what do you expect that? To be? Yes, thank you. We currently have a provisional patent and we're working on the utility and design um, this year. Great. We're going to have to end it there. Oh, drat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Cindy. You. Congrats. Thank you. Good job. So now we're going to bring in Emily Ramirez from Bilingue. Emily, are you ready? I am ready. Great. Thank you, judges, for all the great comments and questions. So, Emily, when you're ready, go ahead. Okay. Perfect. Hi, I'm Emily, first generation Latinx, founder of Bilingue, also known as Billy. And so personal family experiences have really exposed me to the fact that growing up in a bilingual household doesn't necessarily mean that a child will be bilingual, right? And throughout my life, I've encountered parents that are bilingual who state that their child is monolingual despite the parent's fluency and daily use in, of both languages at home. And at Billy, we aim to be a tool for parents interested in changing this and also a tool for parents simply interested in having their child learn a second language. And so Billy aims to address two main problems. One, the decline and loss of native language speaking skills, and two, current language learning ed tech tools for children 
fail to really intellectually and physically engage the user, oftentimes creating a passive and less meaningful learning experience. And so Bilingua is an edtech app designed to prevent generational communication gaps and develop secondary language as an asset within all children ages one through seven, specifically with interactive engaging lessons. And we incorporate our digitally interactive hardware in the form of letters, numbers, and shapes that actually um, interact directly with our app via touch screens in order to allow for that engaging learning experience. And overall, our solution is based on the fact that when we can hold the attention of children, we can better educate them, as proven through a lot of research, so, such as um, the Lego Foundation's play-based research. And so the digital language learning global market in 2018 represented 5.7 billion, with an expected increase to 17 billion in 27. Our strength lies in today's digital age, and combining this with a platform like Billy, which provides both physically and intellectually engaging platform for kids, we can fill this gap in the digital language market, which consists of platforms that only really engage the users intellectually. And our goal is to facilitate access to secondary language development by treating it as an asset that, if cultivated early, will ultimately translate into generational wealth. And so our product consists of sustainable digitally interactive hardware known as DigiPieces. These contain strategic touch points on the back and use the body's natural electricity to allow for shape differentiation when placed on the touch screen. And our app consists of interactive engaging lessons and a child-friendly layout. And we'll provide access to our app using the freemium model where a paid subscription will allow for wider access to our platform. And the hardware will be available at a separate cost via our website directly. And so our philanthropic concept allows for membership or digi pieces to be donated. Early adopters are going to be language acquisition teachers with children and early exp expatriate millennial parents in the U.S. And we aim to attract these markets through social media platforms as well as through educational trade shows. And so there's no product like Billy that focuses on secondary language acquisition while engaging children both intellectually and physically through bilingual lessons. Marbotic, all the way at the right, is the most comparable platform. It uses the inter interactive hardware and an app aimed at preparing children for preschool in their primary language. However, it's not a secondary language app in the traditional sense where one learns a second language. And so I'm Emily, the founder, Latinx, experience as a translator. Will Bet is a language acquisition teacher and my advisor for language development in children K through five. Our mentors to date have consisted of James Sheridan from Blackstone Legal, Greg Feely, and Julie Stapleton from Temple University. The financial model is feasible if launched, launched in 22, with an expected revenue of about 1 million with a growth of 300% from 22 to 23 and 200% from 23 to 24. And so, so far this past summer, I've raised 15,000 in non-diluted funds, and I'm in the process of outsourcing the app and hardware prototypes development as we speak. And I'm conducting market research using surveys and virtual interviews as well. And this past summer, Bilingo was selected for a competitive Blackstone Fellowship, which provided funding and business development resources as well. And our intention is to launch by 2022. Okay. Thank you, Emily. Congratulations. Well done. Excellent. Okay, yes. uh, for judges, how about we go back to the Krista, Jenny, Cheryl order? Great. Bring you back up. Hi, Emily. Thanks. This was really awesome. And as an education investor, although we focus on post secondary, I loved I loved seeing your product. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious. So I get you're focusing on influencers and earlier adopters mm -hmm. to begin with. But kind of how do you over time expect to reach your customers and um, of course, with my Lumina hat on, encouraging you to um, make this accessible to lower income families as well as so how, how you might be able to, to do that. Yeah, so just to touch on your first question, we aim to reach the first group that I had mentioned. So those millennial parents and then those um, ELL teachers uh, directly through social media or also just like through word of mouth, as well as trade shows. And then we we would like to um, bring it into schools where ELL is something or English as a second language ESL is commonly used. Um, there's a lot of bureaucracy with that. So right now, as we launch our products, we would like to just begin with those millennial parents because we think that'll be just an easier market to like penetrate at the beginning. And then for reaching social, lower socioeconomic um, families, we do implement that donate buy one, buy one, donate one platform. So that way um, 
the person who's purchasing it feels good about doing it. And then also those who don't have the financial resources can still access it. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it my turn? I, I didn't keep track yes, of the order. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, so I think having, um, a, again, a third language is such an important thing, particularly as we become more global and we're traveling around and doing business around the world. And while I don't um, have the expertise around how you build that capability um, in adults and children, I do have a lot of experience as my daughter goes to a school where they teach three languages. So I'm aware of a pain point that I hear all the time, and that is the parents who don't speak a second language don't know what their kid like. Is it right? Is it they don't know <laughs> what's going on? So I'm wondering what support you provide to parents in this in your, in your service model because they're not going to know how to support the child. Right. So for families who just simply want their child to learn a secondary language or even possibly like a third language, um, we do aim to create our lessons in a way that it's interactive with the parents. So there's activities where the parent can come in and they can help or just assist with the process. Because children also learn through play, but they also learn when their parents are incorporated in their learning process. So that's something that we're interested in incorporating. And there's going to be like a reading section to the app as well. So we hope that parents are able to sit down, read to their child and vice versa. Versa. If you ever need experts on that, let me know because my whole little school is full of them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks, Jenny. Hey, Cheryl. So, yeah, um, I'd say, well, one, what at the end of the day, like, inspire you to do this? What keeps you going here? Because I think that's also a key motivator a lot of times when, when things get rough during a startup. And, you know, is there anything from COVID too that in terms of tailwinds that you might have seen there that would be interesting? Thank you. Yeah, so just personal family experiences. Um, I have a very big family, Latino family, Latinx family. Um, and I have cousins who speak both languages, Spanish and English, and then some that don't. And I've noticed that there's communication gaps with like our grandparents, for example. And that's just um, an issue that is dealt with a lot of expatriate families who move to the U.S. So I hope to strengthen those communication ties. Um, so that they like if I'm a child who only speaks English, I can communicate with my grandma who only speaks um, that native language within my family. Because um, those are such important um, relationships to have, as well as speaking another language is great for business when you grow up, you know, to be able to um, work to, for multinational companies and overseas as well. All right. That's our time. Thank you, Emily. Good job. Thank you. For Very your time. well done. Now we're going to invite Yaritza Vargas to the stage uh, for Lingo Help. Hi, Yaritza. Hi, how are you? Great. I see your slides, so you're raring to go. Awesome. It's really, really great to be with you all today. I'm Yaritza, co-founder of Lingo Health and a proud first-generation Dominican immigrant. Ever since I learned how to speak English, I've been the family interpreter, care navigator, going to all the doctor's appointments for my grandparents, parents, and everyone in between. And I'm sure many of my fellow children of immigrants can relate here. And so I'm building Lingo Health for our families because we deserve a better healthcare experience that honors our family's language and cultures. Our aging population is becoming more and more diverse. The number of Americans aged 65 plus will double by 2060 and non-white seniors will make up almost half of this population with a whopping over $503 billion in Medicare spending alone. And even in the midst of these demographic trends, our healthcare system is just not doing enough to help meet the needs of our families. Of all immigrants who have been in the US for over 20 plus years, and this includes my own parents, 43% identify as not being English proficient and of those, almost half report having poor health status. And so this challenge really falls on us. Us young adults who are helping our loved ones with healthcare are doing so at a rate three times higher than our peers from native English speaking households. But we're not really given the tools to be meaningfully involved. We've conducted over 270 discovery interviews to date that have really summed up this journey here on the screen. Our loved ones just don't feel welcomed by the healthcare system, so they're really only using it when things get super serious. For example, my parents try to get care when they can fly back to home to the Dominican Republic. And when they do see care here in the US, it's usually emergency care. They're sent home with instructions, either in English, or as we've talked to a lot of doctors who have admitted, 
they just throw it into Google Translate and send patients on their way. And our loved ones are left to figure this out by ourselves. And meanwhile, we're left to piece together what happened and how we can best support. And so of course we deserve better. And so we've set out on this journey, my co-founder Jessica and I have built a team of investors and advisors around us to be able to tackle the question that we've heard come up in every single one of our interviews. What can I do next? And so we're bridging the parts where this journey falls apart. By building a digital health platform that supports our loved ones care in their lang language and preferred cultural context. Our long-term vision is really to become the trusted care provider that provides culturally affirming care in the US and we're starting with care coordination. So our initial beta is a care coordination tool for multilingual families. So being able to build for the English fluent and tech savvy millennial who supports their loved one's care. And so you and your siblings, for example, can have one place to stay on top of helping your parents with their medications, visits and any follow-up care. Meanwhile, your loved one doesn't even have to download a new app. We will communicate with them in their preferred language on their preferred channel. And so for my mom, it's undeniably WhatsApp. And so why now? The pandemic, of course, has shed light on the health disparities that are facing our families on a national scale. But those of us from our, like these communities already knew this. So in a recent survey, when asked about what we as a country should prioritize, 70% of Latinas mentioned access to healthcare. And so let's show the healthcare system that our families truly deserve better care. I invite you to join our upcoming beta by going to this link. It's launching later this year and sharing it with others. I also encourage you to get in touch. I'd love to connect. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. It's uh, very well done. Okay. How about we go Jenny, Cheryl, then Krista this time. Hey, Yaritza. I definitely can empathize with what you're trying to solve because I support my mom and her health care and it is definitely a nightmare scenario going on. Um, and so my question is, health care is a highly regulated compliance landmine. So I'm curious, what is like, what are your top compliance issues in this business model and how are you addressing them? Yeah, so we're starting off with direct to consumer, which right now doesn't require us to be HIPAA compliant, but that's something I'm definitely intimately familiar with as I was on the founding team of a digital health nonprofit and actually led their transition to becoming a HIPAA compliant organization. So I definitely saw like that takes time, it takes money. And so that's something that we're starting early, engaging with those same vendors, finding new ones in order to do it in a way that is very cost effective as well as gets us um, able to move to the telemedicine piece much sooner because that's something that's definitely required. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to learn a little bit more, uh, Yaritza, about your betas, kind of what uh, what are the key features that you guys will have in order to make this as sticky as possible. Um, a lot of times people try to go like on the sauna or whatever and be organized with their lives, but then, you know, practice is not as, <laughs> as clear. So it would be great to kind of see how you will retain uh, folks that will be on the platform and what are the best features. Yeah, so really what we're trying to do is try, try not to change as much of people's already like behavior. So we heard over and over people saying like, I have a family WhatsApp where mom will send pictures of her care instructions that she gets after a doctor's visit, for example. So we fit in nicely with that because we allow your loved one to just send that directly to us. And then we digitize it ourselves by being able to pull out the action items. Here are the things that you should be doing. Here's when mom should be set, scheduling that follow-up appointment because a lot of these things are just falling through the gaps, uh, through the cracks, excuse me. And so by fitting into everyone's existing workflow, we're not really trying to change too much behavior. Um, as well as we are making it so it's like multi-caregiver. So everyone can have their own ownership of different pieces. So you can coordinate as a family and like, kind of hold each other accountable too. Hi, Aritza. This is awesome. And I really find your Genesis story so compelling, right? I did not have that experience personally, but I know lots of people who have. Um, and I think that's really important. So um, like Cheryl, I was going to kind of ask you about how the the app gets used and you did answer part of my question. So I was asking, you know, do physicians need to um, engage with the app to put in information 
or not, you know, and so you explained how you get the medical information into the app, but that still is assuming that there is a, a point person in the family that gets that information, understands that information, mm -hmm. and then shares that um, with with Lingo Health to then upload. And so I'm curious, are you have you thought about providing any supports or training um, to, to help the users actually use it as efficiently as possible? Yeah, so because we're doing, starting off with a closed beta, we're really testing this onboarding piece. So we're starting off by having videos and user manuals, as well as offering phone calls to both like the actual user of the app and the patient. So this is something I've done before at the last startup I was at is being able to like have that high touch onboarding model so that you can really get someone to fully understand what they're joining, because it can be a little bit confusing for your parent for you to say, hey, I'm signing up for this app. They're going to need your health information. And so it's really building that trust early on. And that's a, a privilege of being able to start off with a closed beta and then figure out how to scale that moving forward. Great. Well, thank you, Yaritza, and thank you to the judges for all your comments and questions. Um, for the judges, just a quick reminder to um, make sure that you're updating the Excel spreadsheet that's online so that we can deliberate um, later on. Uh, fantastic. So moving on, um, Vanessa, we'd like to have Vanessa come to the stage from Deal Engine. Hi, Vanessa. Welcome. Up, oh, you're on mute. Sorry, I muted. No problem. Okay, when you're ready. All right. Hello, my name is Vanessa Archambo Morales, co founder and CTO of Deal Engine, a data driven equity crowdfunding platform for founders and investors where, regardless of background or connections, founders can achieve launch velocity. I personally know the challenges early startup founders, especially underrepresented founders face in finding traction for their company and securing that early money. I'm a queer Latina software engineer who years ago had a great idea for our startup, but I had no accredited network to fundraise a friends and family round to get my idea off the ground. So I put my idea back on the shelf and now I'm building the very platform that would have helped me an approach that can reshape how early startups get mentorship, support and access to capital. So, who gets funded? There are an estimated 25 million US entrepreneurs seeking investment, 99.7% of which never achieve angel or VC investment. Of those that do get funding, Black and Latinx founders only receive 2.6% of total funding, but equity crowdfunding is becoming a viable option for fundraising. Equity crowdfunding is a relatively new regulation that lets startups and private businesses raise capital from the crowd in exchange for a small bits of equity. It is SEC regulated and allows founders to raise amounts up to $5 million. So think Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but instead of getting swag in exchange for investment, retail level investors get a small piece of the company they're investing in, and it allows founders to fundraise from their own communities. The two major pitfalls we've noticed in equity crowdfunding campaigns are one, founders not yet having the team and product market fit needed for scaling, and two, founders mispricing or overvaluing their companies in the early raise therefore making it more difficult to raise institutional investment down the road. Let's take a look at a real example of some crowdfunding campaign issues. So this company ran a real campaign on one of the leading platforms, and it has a beautiful and compelling marketing page. Most investment decisions are largely driven by the data presented. A price per share of 43 cents and a minimum investment of $100. Through these campaigns, the company has raised almost $2 million over the last two years. But when you look at the data provided to the SEC, we learned that their monthly recurring revenues are only $5,000. Based on their most recent $23 million valuation, the company is valued at more than 1,200 times revenues. There are other signs here that show a lack of a patch of profitability. And there are millions of retail investors hungry to invest in bold ideas and diverse teams. With a landscape of hype-driven crowdfunding campaigns, how can they surface the business fundamentals to make an informed decision? Deal Engine wants to create a better crowdfunding platform. One where we focus on compelling reasons for investability, where investor decisions are driven by clear data about the company and its traction. One where founders can establish their crowdfunding campaign on a solid foundation of knowledge and sane economics. From industry reports, we know that team and product market fit account for 80% of startup failures. And for this reason, we've built an analytical framework that measures those key drivers. We roll all of these measures into our deal score which is an easy to understand measure of the current company traction and viability. 
We identify high potential companies while also giving those founders the direction they need. Before any founder can create an equity crowdfunding campaign on our platform, they enter their KPIs and metrics into our complementing crowdfunding readiness platform, where we provide founders with tools, resources, and a guided path to critical traction and viability. We provide step-by-step -step guides to founders based on their vertical and company stage, and team chemistry assessments to ensure founders are building diverse and resilient teams. Founders can explore an array of fundraising options and resources in addition to the crowdfunding path, and along the way, we collect and analyze company data to provide feedback to the companies and updates to investors. We launched our beta crowdfunding readiness platform in April and have currently held two cohorts where we have helped uh, companies achieve wins, such as fundraising and winning pitch events. We are currently in Startout's Growth Lab Accelerator, and we have just this week confirmed our first partnerships to bring companies into our platform. Okay, we're going to have to stop there, Vanessa. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. I think, Cheryl, it's apropos that you go first and then Krista and Jenny. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, this is clearly up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> we just announced our Series B $150 million round today, which is why I'm, I'm, I have three hours oh, of exhausted. But um, I know I've been, I've been in Republic for the past three years, and I've known that this is very, very regulatory, legal compliance heavy. We spun out of Angelus and used a lot of their legal and their team and their expertise in order to, um, in order to kind of execute. And 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 it's also a marketplace, right? You have to both mm -hmm. be able to core great founders, and you're also able to have to bring in investors. And it's a volume game at the end of the day. So yeah. my questions are twofold. If you could, don't mind uh, telling me a little bit more about kind of the legal um, compliance side of things and how you're you're dealing with that, because it has to be like a great legal team that will be dealing with the SEC and FINRA. You kind of have to be like BFFs with them. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second part is more around how are you planning on dealing on both sides of the marketplace? Definitely. So we are fundraising for our pre-seed and prepping for our seed uh, next year so that we can cover our legal expenses to get um, you know approved for the SEC FINRA. We know it's a very <laughs> complex and heavy kind of process. And so we haven't launched our crowdfunding platform yet. We're planning to do that at the end of next year. And right now we are focusing on our crowdfunding readiness founder platform to help collect that data, give founders some direction on how to fundraise. And so currently, instead of referring our founders to our own platform, we are referring them out to the major players such as Republic, Star and Engine, uh, and getting the referral fee for that. So we're trying to test out our data model first to make sure that's strong to be able to find signals for early success for founders and startups, especially in different verticals, so that we can be ready once we pave that whole road to open up our crowdfunding platform, hopefully late next year. And so to build that two-sided kind of marketplace in order to get founders into our platform, um, our initial go-to-market plan is we are creating partnerships with VCs and accelerators to accept their rejected deal flow uh, because we know there's a lot of gems in there that maybe were just too early. If you can accept 10 companies, what happens to company 11, 12, all the way up to the, the thousandth company, you know, maybe they just need a little bit of nudge and a little bit of help to figure out their product market fit and to figure out the next steps in order to be a really good viable company. And so we're bringing in those companies through those partnerships in order to build out our data model and to test out how well uh, the response is to our help on our crowdfunding um, readiness platform. So. Hi, Vanessa. Um, I, I love that you're examining problems and challenges that have, have uh, bothered me for a long time, right? That this yeah. concentration of, of capital going to the, the few and then everybody else um, just missing out. Um, I like the part of your model that you're focusing on this TA and capacity building for the founders. I think that is really, really critical. Um, but I'm curious how that could then affect your ability to scale um, the, the platform if, if you're doing all this more hands-on stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. And so it is a numbers game, like Cheryl said. And so um, initially, you know, we are bringing in thousands and thousands and thousands of companies and we are separating out our two platforms 
uh, and to be able to really focus on that initial platform to be able to give traction um, and help companies like expand and grow, right? And our initial idea in the very beginning before we ever thought of being a crowdfunding platform was just to be a resource for startups and founders uh, to help them kind of achieve traction and viability. But then we looked at the market and we were like, well, this isn't something that's scalable. And so the revenue model that we thought of, well, if we're going to have thousands of companies and be referring them out to crowdfunding, then hopefully we can get enough gems into our crowdfunding platform to be able to. So Vanessa, we're going to have to call the time. Oh, sorry. Thank you for those questions. And <laughs> sorry, Jenny, we didn't get to you on this go around. But congratulations, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you for all the questions. Excellent. Okay. Um, so for our seventh and, and final finalist, um, Claudia from Cali, Bu Cali Bueno is going to smooth out our our final pitches. Hi, Claudia. Hi. Yeah. Uh, can you guys see me? Give me one second. Yes. Just, just getting myself situated here. Okay. When you're ready. Okay. Well, thank you for having me here. Let me just put uh, one second, guys. Thank you for being patient. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> I'm ready. Great, well, thank you for having me here. I'm Claudia Mercado, founder and CEO of Cali Bueno. And Cali Bueno came about in about 2016 when my mother suffered an injury and we couldn't figure out how to really make her better. And the only thing we found to help her was a cannabis topical. So that created the desire for me to help other people that might be able to use cannabis for their health and wealth. Also having worked in the tech industry and realizing that uh, we were only Latinos, Latinas were 1% of the tech industry, uh, there was also another desire in me that was built to jump into this industry, make an impact, be loud, be seen, be known, and create change. Hence, Cali Bueno Delivery, uh, I'm sorry, Cali Bueno started in 2018 as a licensed micro business, and we operate out of Oakland, California, and we hope that through cannabis we can make the world uh, brighter. Um, currently, as an operator, we are part of uh, an emerging growing market alone in 2020, uh, California saw 5 million active consumers engage in the industry, both recreational and medicinal, uh, generating uh, $4.4 billion in sales. And the market also is creating a lot of revenue for the state of California. For every $100 a consumer spends, uh, there's an additional $25 to $38 added to their bill, uh, which is great because a lot of that money, the idea behind regulating the industry, that that money is going to go back to our communities. However, in the short term, uh, the problem is that it's leaving a lot of uh, Californians without access to cannabis because they don't have uh, cannabis retailers. Only half of the counties in California allow cannabis uh, retails to be there. Uh, putting people's health at risk, a lot of people are ending, uh, are having to go buy uh, the weed in the black market, which is currently about $8 billion. And the reason for that is the high taxation and the lack of access. We also uh, see some social and economic disparities within certain demographics like the Latino community. Uh, the, the average household is $50,000. So using cannabis on a day-to-day -day basis for your health and well-being is, is not really feasible financially. But as an operator, what we're really seeing and what's exciting us is the need for a lot of representation in um, how we can be a change agent. You know, although 39% of the California population is Latino, only 1% of licenses are Latino owned and only 2% of brands are Latino owned. So this is creating a, a great gap in disparity with the Latino community. Um, what we did again is we, we showed up to the industry. We've been licensed in 2018 and we were just, we just are fighting for survival and are making making a stand, but also showing people that we can make, we, you know, we can build great products. We have a Cali Lindo branded products uh, that has flour, pre-rolls, tinctures, and we're making this accessible to our communities and also building community uh, uh, value add by bringing products directly to people's homes by launching our delivery service. And we're able to make all of this work by our ability to really leverage technology and truly building community. As a Latino and Latina who deeply cares about the well-being of my community and others, I am determined to make a change in this industry. So we make it super simple for customers to come to us directly, order online, they can call us, uh, we speak Spanish, retailers can order from us, only pay wholesale prices, so we're available in more retail locations. Our revenue model, revenue model since day one has been source our own weed, build relationships with farmers. We have sourced over 1.3 thousand or uh, over a thousand pounds from cannabis farms up north, sold over 100,000 units and made over 1,500 deliveries here in the Bay Area. 
None of this could have been possible without our team. But before we get into that, you know, the, the target roadmap is really driven by our desire to be uh, a company that creates impact. We want to be in more stores. We want to be seen. We want to be known. We want to let Latino know that they too can have a seat at the table and that they can actually afford these products if they're, if they're coming from companies that are value aligned. And again, None of this could be possible without our team. We have an advisor who has worked in Barclays Global Investments, understands data, understands okay. systems. Okay, Claudia, and, thank uh, you very yeah. much. Thank you. Congratulations, very well And thank done. you, uh, Hispanics and Philanthropy and SoCal. Okay. appreciate you guys. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Claudia. Um, Jenny, thank since you. we weren't able to get to you last, why don't we start with you, then Krista, then Cheryl. Sure. Well, first of all, I think the cannabis market is exploded, and I often, like, just cringe when like our people are not in it and we should be more <laughs> yeah. um because it's also like there's cannabis of everything products how are you differentiating obviously you're targeting latino but like within that like segment like how do you differentiate like how strong is your brand who's working on yeah, it well, with you? yeah well our goal was to really care to latinos but along the way you know we found that our brand actually is is been really well received by the general population. Everybody loves our culture. So the reason how we stand out is by being really value driven. So all of our flour comes from small family farms up in Northern California, all the legacy operators that, that had been here before regulation started. Um, and we also only for our delivery, we only, only have products that don't have any corn syrup, any dyes. So we really dive deep into, you know, is this industry going to become like Whole Foods or are we going to have a bunch of liquor stores in our communities? And that's really what drives me. I think that we're at a point where we need to really dictate how we want people to partake in the industry and it has to be from a, from a place of empathy and values. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Claudia. Great job. Hi, thank you. I think this is fascinating. I don't know anything about this, this market, but um, you're making me really excited. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's like uh, being an entrepreneur on steroids, let me tell you. It's probably the most challenging industry there is. I'm sure. I'm sure. So I have a question for you sure. about the market and kind of market acceptance. Sure. Um, just curious, you know, and I see this within my own family, right, that younger people, of course, are more open to this, willing to try and buy, whereas older folks who might actually benefit for medical reasons are really resistant and still still see this as, uh, you know, as something illegal that they would never do. I'm kind of curious if you've noticed that in the marketplace, and if so, how would you then overcome that resistance? Yeah, definitely. So right now, the average the average consumer in the regulated market is 44 years old, uh, which means that it's a profession that can actually afford cannabis, pay those taxes, engage with the delivery service. Um, but the biggest consumers that are coming in the pipeline are the millennials the people that are, you know, kind of learning more about cannabis that want to actually take care of their health and find people like Kelly Bueno that have value added, you know, to their to their cannabis experience. Um, but we are facing the traditional market, the black market. There's a lot of people that are younger, unfortunately, that are falling victim because they can't afford cannabis or people that are older that are in fixed income as well. Um, so we want to overcome it by letting them Show them that it's easy and that there's people like us that are willing to pass any savings that we can down to them. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Claudia. And I love the fact that, you know, we have more uh, Latinx brands being a part of this movement that a lot of times, you know, have uh, really affected disproportionately our community. So that's one. Um, I'd say, if anything, uh, what, I guess, from your background, like, what are the skills and, you know, things that you bring to the table that will allow for this to become like a billion dollar business, right? Like, what exactly, yeah. like, the team is also, once again, something that I, I always look at deep in. So I would love to, for you to get into that a little bit. Yeah. Well, for me personally, I'm, I'm personally passionate. I, I am a consumer and I really, you know, like when my mom started using cannabis, then all of her 10 sisters started using cannabis and um, knowing how hard my mom works. And there's a lot of women like my mother who can use this. That's, that's my personal passion. So I think my strength is not giving up. I mean, it's been four years. We've been burglarized. We've, I mean, so many things have happened that uh, at any given time we could have quit. And I think quitting would have been the easy way out. So I think for me, it's like, I'm not stopping until we really make an impact because this is beyond me. This is going to impact generations to come. So that's what drives me. Um, so with that, yeah. Claudia, yeah. we're going to conclude. And thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you for, for the pitch and uh, presentation. And judges, thank you again uh, for the wonderful comments and questions. So that concludes the seven different presentations. So we're going to move on to 
um, our uh, deliberation. Um, and during our deliberation, as mentioned before, we will have actually a fireside chat. I'm going to just share really quickly by screen. Um, so you, give me one second here. All uh, right. Okay, if we can put that really quickly up. Tech. Excellent. Um, so uh, during our deliberation with the judges, if the judges don't mind, go on to the, um, the other uh, video um, uh, uh, platform so that we can connect on that. I'll meet you there in a few minutes. Um, but during that time, we'll have a fireside chat between Christine Michi and Jennifer Garcia. Um, we will also have an opportunity that Christine will explain to you in terms of voting for the audience award. So very exciting opportunity for you all in the audience to, um, to, to vote on your favorite uh, presentation. And so um, right now I'm gonna hand this off to Christine Michi, who um, is a senior advisor for our organization um, at Hispanics and Philanthropy, and she also runs her own social Hi, everybody. Here we are. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Christine. How are you? Great. So so you all should know in the audience, it feels like it's just Jennifer and I having a one-on-one -on -one Zoom, but we know you're all watching. And so thank you for being in the audience and participating. Um, this has been so much fun. And Jennifer and I in our own separate places have been watching along with you. I've seen all these great ideas, these great women, and it's fun to, to be another pair um, talking about the same subject. So uh, Christy Mitchie with Impactful and a senior advisor to Hispanics and Philanthropy, and so proud and grateful to introduce Jennifer Garcia, who's the Chief Operating Officer of LBAN, which is a great acronym, and it stands for Latino Business Action Network. Um, and I'll tell you that those of us in this work around social change of any type need to be able to measure things, right? They say what, what's measured is can be improved. And uh, LBAN and the folks that Jennifer works with are one of the go-to organizations for data about improvements and change in the Latinx community, specifically around um, business and economic resiliency. So Jennifer, I'd love you to give us a, give the audience a quick overview of what LBAN is and does, and uh, then we'll get into how that relates to what we just saw and what is happening. Well, if I could just start, Christine, by commending all of the seven women that just presented and pitched, that was phenomenal. And if it shows me anything, which it showed me much, but one thing is to say that our community is so diverse. We are not a monolithic community where we have the stereotypical Latino or Latina owned businesses. But what did I see? It ranged from travel app to ed tech to fintech, you know, and kind of everything in between cannabis, which is really exciting. And I just want to say, rock on women, you guys did phenomenal in your presentation. Well, a little bit about Latino Business Action Network. We are a nonprofit that collaborates with Stanford University, and we have a mission and a focus of strengthening the United States, and our lens is um, Latino entrepreneurship. And so how do we do that? We have three different uh, areas of focus. One is research, second is education, and the third is ecosystem development. So on the research side, Christine, you mentioned we are the... Um, Producers of the most robust research on Latino entrepreneurship. Our goal is to understand what is impacting you as Latino and Latino business owners. What are the trends? What are the factors contributing and impeding growth? And disseminating that information into the hands of policymakers, corporate leaders, business leaders, anybody that has the ability to shape um, environments that are conducive to growth. That's the research side. On the education side, this is probably what we are most known for. Every Twice a year, we uh, facilitate a scaling program at Stanford Graduate School of Business, where we go out and we recruit Latina and Latino business owners from across the country. This is a nationwide program. Um, and they come to Stanford to participate in an eight-week online scaling program taught by Stanford professors professors augmented by Al Alban. You get a one-on-one -on -one mentor. You get tons of information, assignments, and education around access to capital. Um, so I'm just going to put the requirements out there because I'm sure there's many of you on this call that could qualify. Is one, you have to be Latino-owned business headquartered in the United States. And then the third requirement is that you have to have 500000 in external funding. So that's our pocket of startups 
or you have to have a million dollars in annual revenue or greater. Um, to date, Christine, just to give you a sense, we have 800 alumni from across the country. And if I could just give a shout out to the last one, Claudia, who you just heard, she is one of our alums from our program. And, and really, what does it do? It pushes you to scale, to scale your business. It provides you with the business principles to take your company to the next level. Fantastic. Thanks. Jeff. Did you get to say all three? Or did I cut you I off? I didn't, but I saw this message from <laughs> Alex. I don't know if you want to insert uh, Alex's note awesome. here. Awesome. Just a verbal shout out to go along with uh, what you can see there. It is time and you're available to jump into the platform and vote for your favorite of the seven women that you just saw. There will be a $5,000 audience award. So you could be a part of making that money move by voting now. And so I'll send it back to Jennifer for the third item. Um, awesome. I do want to say, I want to jump onto your, your um, 800 alumni from the scaling project. If I'm if I read correctly, they have a combined income of four billion um, in annual revenue. The, the the founders and enterprises that have been through the program, the scaling program. For those of you thinking about, do you want to jump in on that? It sounds like it's a very successful uh, model and a very successful program. Absolutely, absolutely. And I and I say that that is our signature program. That's our gateway into our network. But our third pillar, which is ecosystem development, starts with those 800 alumni. Right. So we take our 800 alumni, we take a network of mentors, a network of our capital providers, and we ask ourselves, how do we continue to create growth pathways that are um, empowering Latino business owners to continue to scale? Because we know scale doesn't happen in a program. It doesn't happen in eight weeks, but it's a journey. And our ecosystem is designed to be with you in that journey to equip you throughout your journey of scale. Um, so within the ecosystem development, there's everything from capacity building to digital transformation, supplier diversity, access to capital definitely is a, a pivotal element in that. Um, but beyond that is networks, right? It is now that you are connected to 800 other alumni from across the country who in a moment's notice um, is there to support, looking to collaborate, looking to do business with each other, to find business for each other. It's just an amazing professional network. I love it. And, you know, that's how business has always been done, right? And how it's done day in and day out. And this is creating for the Latinx community, that vibrant network to deliver to them and each other these sort of services and supports. So folks, in terms of a statistic that we can kind of hang the discussion on around which we were just watching these wonderful founders, less than 2% of all venture dollars go to Latinx owned businesses, 2%. So, and what we've talked about before, Jennifer, and I'd love you to say a little bit more about now is, you know, it's not because they're riskier. There may be perceived, you know, perceptions, reality problem, right? So Elban is in the business of breaking down those perceptions with reality, with introductions to women like these, because their, their growth rate is comparable. Their credit worthiness is comparable. There's perhaps just per some, some perception that needs to be broken down. So tell us how Elban works on that. Yeah, and if I could just really highlight the opportunity here, both from um, from entrepreneurs, I think this is important for you to understand this in your own mindset, but also for capital providers, both on the debt and the equity, that there is an investment opportunity. Um, and the investment not opportunity is not only for an ROI on your investment, but it is the country's opportunity. So let me tell you that if... If we would get Latino-owned businesses to perform at the average rate of non-Latino-owned businesses, of white-owned businesses, if they were equally generated, if they were generating an equal amount of revenue, not, not anything greater, just on par, that would generate an additional $1.4 trillion dollars. Um, to the country's economy, $1.4 trillion. Now, when we think about the investment opportunity, as you mentioned, Latino-owned businesses are oftentimes outpacing the revenue growth and on par with their credit riskiness as other non-Latino businesses. And so there was, a, there was a comment that is just so good that I have to share is 
when you're thinking about investment opportunities, you cannot look east when you're looking for a sunset, right? So you have to be intentional about finding these Latino owned businesses and great investment opportunities because they're out there. They're not, they do not offer any other risky um, riskiness than their counterparts. And they certainly are, as we've seen today, innovative. They're Per, uh, persistent, they persevere, they have that grit in them. And all in all, just amazing ingenuity in what we think today. And and not only today, but that are out there in our community. I love it. And I, I guess maybe the corollary would be true. You don't look west if you're looking for a sunrise. Like you need to look in the right place for what you're looking for. And what we're showing now, what Elben is showing and what this pitch competition is showing is that these opportunities and these great ideas and great, great founders are everywhere. I was interested that the um, LBAN kind of mission statement doesn't start by talking about businesses. It talks about strengthening the U.S. by improving the lives of Latin, Latinos, Latinx people. You could just stop period there. And then, you know, different organizations and different people could do different things. Your focus is on the business opportunities, but the goal is still to strengthen the U.S. kind of full stop. And then how by improving the lives of Latinos. I'm interested in that in that. Uh, kind of foundational statement. I'm so glad you asked. Yes, you're absolutely right. There are so many amazing organizations that are impacting the lives of Latinos that are impacting the U.S. and why we chose to specifically focus on entrepreneurs and, and have that entrepreneurship lens. Here is what we know. The data tells us that, that Latinos are the fastest growing business unit, right? We are starting businesses at a faster pace than any other segment. We also know, unfortunately, that Latino owned businesses tend to stay small. So only 3% of Latino owned businesses ever reach a million dollars in annual revenue or greater. We believe that if we are able to create and empower businesses to become really large businesses, the ripple effect on that is amazing, right? We are, we are by creating large businesses, we are creating wealth. We are creating general wealth, generational wealth. Um, Latino owned businesses would then more likely would would most likely uh, they were being more likely to promote other Latinos into senior leadership roles. They would be creating more jobs for our economy and they would be investing back into the communities and where they live and serve. So when we have large Latino owned businesses, they have more influence, they have more clout within their community, they are often more involved in policies and in very high level networks. And so we believe that when we when we lift up this community of a growing community, a young, fast paced Latino community that is growing, and business segments that is the fastest creators, we the ripple effect then has an overall positive, tremendous effect on the entire country. I love it. I was thinking, and, and you may recall this statistic or maybe outdated, but I think I heard once that the median household net worth of a family with a business associated with it broadly is about one and a half times, but in the Latino community, it's about three times, just because there's the, there's more disparity, the baseline is lower, and the opportunity is greater. That closing the racial wealth gap is something that's gotten some attention over the course of the last year and a half, the pandemic and the racial reckoning. Can you talk a little bit about the racial wealth gap and how small business ownership and, and scaling of enterprises fits into that? Yeah, well, here's here's the thing. When I when we think about um, Latinos, we are a segment that is probably comes from less educated parents, right? Just by nature of of our background and what we've experienced, and so many immigrants coming, um, we may not have the same social capital that other other segments have. And so, when you don't have the social capital, you don't have the networks. Right. You don't have the networks. You don't pick up a phone and say, oh, my, you know, my tennis coach is also the banker at X, Y, Z. And I'm going to call him and ask him for a loan. Or, you know, I know the founder of X, Y, Z. And so we are building that and that will be built over time. But it is so important right now for us to be intentional about building a social capital, because when we have social capital, it is 
exponential, right? If I am connected to someone, the ripple effect and the impact of me sharing that information or that introduction down to the second and third connection really becomes a powerful element in the the elevation of the entire community. And so when we think about, you know, the wealth gap and the racial wealth gap, a lot of that stems from the social capital that we do or do not have. And Another reason why I would encourage all of the business owners that might be listening on on this call right now, how important it is to be plugged in to a professional network. Mm. Um, I invite you to take a look at Elban. If I could put my plug there, take a look at Elban, but take a look at local, you know, local networks, trade organizations, anything that's going to increase your network and increase your social capital. Well, I, I was just looking at your name again. Your last name is Network. Right. I mean, so right. you're very intentional about saying um, if that isn't there already, we can build it, which is how networks have always. I mean, that is the case. Right. Ecosystems and networks are built by those in it. Clearly. And that's exactly what we've known we had to do. And I think there is a movement here on the VC space as well. Right. If it, if the current structure and framework is not serving our community, let's build it. And that's what we've seen. Some of these Latino owned um, or Latino led uh, VC firms really focusing on diverse communities, diverse founders or Latinx founders specifically. And we need to do that, right? We need to have the ability to say, let's create. If it doesn't exist for us, let's create it. And we're seeing that. Um, we definitely want to accelerate that pace and we want to break through in some of the traditional um, norms as well. But it's certainly something that we can do is create. I love it. I'm thinking and for different people in the audience from different categories. I'm thinking we've talked about small business owners and encouraging them to check out the website, check out possibly being in a cohort, um, which I think spring is the next application for the scaling program. We've talked to investors saying, you know, keep these kinds of businesses in mind. And I'm wondering um, Jennifer, if there is like, is, would you talk to your financial advisor and say, hey, I want to find Latino owned businesses? Is that a conversation that investors should be having? Here, yeah, let me, if I could just add a couple things to what you just said there, Christine. So for anyone that is, you know, interested in scaling their business and taking their business to the next level that may qualify, um, we are accepting applications now. So I would encourage you to go onto our website. It is the Stanford Latino Scaling Program. One of the things that we always get, right, the question is how much does it cost? The program is valued at over $11,000, but we want to remove any cost barrier. And so the tuition cost to participate in the eight-week program will be $2,000 in 2022. So it is very affordable. I would encourage you to get your application in as soon as possible. We will have rolling admittance. Um, and then the second question is, how do we as LBAN, how do we really connect with other VCs and other organizations that are trying to serve Latino businesses across the country, both for investment purposes or otherwise? I welcome relationships and conversations. I think we need to link arms and be fluid. Um, oftentimes I say, we have such a pot of gold of these amazing companies and there's these VC companies that are looking to connect and find, you know, gems. We need to be able to have that fluent conversation and referral. And, and the reverse is true also, right? There's some VC communities that come in con connection with some really great companies that would qualify for our program. And there can be that um, inner dialogue between the organization. So for anyone listening, um, certainly open to conversations and collaboration in that regard. I love it. And, and I feel like, you know, this is sort of this is this is the American story. Right. And this is the next wave of the American story, creating these opportunities and creating a, a rich and vibrant ecosystem to support them. So thank you, Jennifer, so much for being part of today. It's going to be really exciting to see folks. Don't forget to vote. Probably there's just a minute left to to get your vote in for the crowd um, prize. And um, we'll be hearing what our judges have to say. Thank you, Christine. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so we we just concluded deliberation. As you can imagine, it was really, really hard um, to be able to um, get to just uh, three awardees. Um, you know, I think part of the goal here is really to make sure that we're showcasing all seven of these fantastic, talented 
uh, Latina entrepreneurs. Um, and just we want to give a congratulations to all of them uh, for really wonderful presentations, but also uh, for their startups, their digital startup design. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing them in years to come uh, with their successes. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to have each of the judges uh, present one of the awards. We're going to go in uh, reverse order. So we're going to go um, third, second, then audience, and then first. Um, so I'd like to invite Jenny um, to tell us about the uh, third place winner. Great. Well, as you mentioned it was a very hard process, and I think we landed on some good decisions, but everybody did phenomenal. Um, but when we went through the scores and deliberated, our third place winner is Marianne with POM. And a couple of feedback points. So hooray, hooray. Um, <laughs> that pitch was just really well done. It was um, like you hit all the highlights, the, the, the problem statement, the solution. I'm very impressed. You have 120 years of combined experience. Like you're, you have a, you're able to answer the questions around customer experience. And so we see a huge potential here. So we want to congratulate you and um, let you know we support you in this journey um, of bringing a solution to many, particularly working families who have to, you know, be away from their kid during the day um, and have that worry. So congratulations. Excellent. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we can't have you, can't find you on the screen. So, but uh, we know you're out there, uh, Marianne, and congratulations. Okay. So now we're going to go um, on to the second award um, and Cheryl uh, will be presenting. Yeah. Um, it's an honor once again to even listen to these pitches and um, it was hard, right? So um, the second place winner here is Lingo Health. <laughs> uh, Yaritza, I think uh, what you have, uh, you know, really uh, pitched for us was something that came from your personal experience. Uh, you have already been uh, testing it out and figuring what will be the best solution for this massive you know, problem that I feel many of us uh, feel as well. And so um, continue going. I hope this helps a little bit. And thank you once again for pitching. Thank you, Cheryl. Yep. And congratulations again, uh, Iritza and Lingo Health. Wonderful job. Um, so we, uh, we're going to skip the audience award really quick because we haven't figured out the vote yet. So uh, we'll come back to that in a second. Um, so let's go to uh, the first award, Krista. Sure. Well, I echo all of the other judges' comments on how amazing all of these women founders are and the exciting uh, products and services that they offer. Um, so our uh, the first place award goes to Menstrual Mates. Um, we think that you've got a really great understanding of the problem and of customer needs. It's a really cool product, right? Never seen anything like this. Um, we love the sustainability aspects of the product. And now speaking just for me, and I am normally a very cynical person, but I think that this could actually change the world in, in a significant and important way. It's a really great, great product. Excellent. Thank you, Krista. Yep. And then, yep. Congratulations. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, really excited for you, Cindy. Um, and so now I have the pleasure of uh, letting everybody know the audience award, uh, and that will be to Greether with 49% of the vote. Congratulations, Greether and Vanessa. Well done, very exciting. Um, I am just gonna do one last quick share of my slide so that I can um, close this out really quick. Um, I know we're at time or just a little bit over time. Uh, but, you know, none of this could happen without the wonderful um, support of SOCAP, the technical team, everybody getting us on here. So thank you very much for SOCAP for partnering with us on this. Judges, all three of you are fantastic leaders in our uh, in our ecosystem, um, your role models. And it was really exciting to have all three of you um, join us today and volunteer your time and thoughts. Um, and thanks to the audience for joining us. And, and really congratulations to all the teams and founders. Like I said before, you know, we're excited for you. This is a great opportunity to showcase and amplify what a wonderful, talented pool of Latinas we have in the startup um, uh, community. Um, and, you know, for the audience out there, let's make sure that we're amplifying these seven. Um, all of them are fantastic and doing really, really great stuff. So with that, I'm going to close out and thank everybody. Um, appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of SOCAP.